Okay, welcome back um, for part two of today's lesson. Um, we left off, we had just finished paragraph two, so now I wanna go ahead and discuss annotating that one. Take a second and highlight the details in this paragraph that suggest fraudulent sale practices. Now, in order to do this, you have to know what fraudulent is. Does anyone know? So if somebody commits fraud, they've done something, um, they faked documents, they've done something illegal, okay? So what in paragraph two suggests fraudulent practices? It's a pretty big paragraph, so go ahead and look through the whole thing. If you underlined things that went into the mixture were tripe and the fat pork and beef suet and hearts and beef and finally the waste ends of veal when they had any. They put these up in several grades and sold them for several prices, but the contents of the cans all came out of the same hopper. It's about in the middle of the paragraph if you are in the actual textbook. Starting here. So the things that went into the mixture were tripe all the way through hopper. Right here. Now, synthesize this information. What would happen today to a company that tried to do this? Consider your background knowledge of the topic in your response. So they, what they were doing is they were making the same like junk, essentially. I mean, it doesn't, nothing good was going into what this canned product was. And they were putting it in the same cans, but labeling them as being a better quality. But they're saying that even though they labeled some as being a better quality and sold them for more money, everything still came out of the same machine. So what would happen, what do you think would happen to a company today if they did the same thing? So a company that, that sold meats that were not chicken as chicken and sold the same food as though it were different grades of quality would be punished if they're caught. So there are huge fines associated with anything in relation to food, especially in America, although this does exist all over the world. And if somebody tried to do the same thing in the States today, because um, this was in the States oh, over a hundred years ago now. Um, if they're caught, there are huge fines associated with it and you could even get shut down. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but in the US, you need special permits to, to sell anything related to food. And the quality has to be kept at a certain level. For example, when I worked at a bakery in university, um, we used to get federal inspectors that would come in and they would look over everything, every piece of machinery, every employee, did they have a hairnet, were they wearing gloves, is it sanitary? Um, and if they found any violations, we got a big fine and we could be shut down, meaning like they could tell us you can't prepare food anymore. So this is pretty serious. All right, let's move on to paragraph three. Another interesting set of statistics that a person might have gathered in Packing Town, those of the various afflictions of the workers. When Yerkes had first inspected the packing plants with Sedvilas, he had marveled while he listened to the tale of all the things that were made out of the carcasses of animals, and of all the lesser industries that were maintained there. Now he found that each one of these lesser industries was a separate little inferno, in its way, as horrible as the killing beds, the source and fountain of them all. 
The workers in each of them had their own peculiar diseases, and the wandering visitor might be skeptical about all the swindles, but he could not be skeptical about these, for the worker bore the evidence of them about on his own person. Generally, he had only to hold out his hand. There were the men in the pickle rooms, for instance, where old Antanas had gotten his death, scarce a one of these that had not some spot of horror on his person. Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck in the pickle rooms, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by the acid, one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who use knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and time again, the base of it had been slashed, till it was a mere lump of flesh against which the man pressed the knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts, until you could no longer pretend to count them or to trace them. They would have no nails. They had worn them off, pulling hides. Their knuckles were swollen, so that their fingers spread out like a fan. There were men who worked in the cooking rooms, in the midst of steam and sickening odors, by artificial light, in these rooms, the germs of tuberculosis might live for two years, but the supply was renewed every hour. There were the beef luggers, who carried 200-pound quarters into the refrigerator cars, a fearful kind of work that began at four o'clock in the morning and that wore out the most powerful men in a few years. There were those who worked in the chilling rooms and whose special disease was rheumatism, the time limit that a man could work in the chilling rooms was said to be five years. Okay, so based on the first half of this paragraph, I want you to go through and mark examples of injury or disease. So what, what are we being told was happening to these people? In, injuries or diseases? All right, so let's name a few. The first one, scrape his finger. They could get a sore. Um, they could have fingers eaten by the acid. Um, they could have one of their fingers slashed, it says the base of it had been slashed. Their hands would be crisscrossed with cuts. They would have no nails. Their knuckles were swollen. Those are all things that could happen. And then in terms of diseases, tuberculosis is one. And rheumatism. Now, what action do you think Sinclair is hoping to inspire by including this information? He's telling us not only is, is what they're putting into the food not you know, permissible, not okay, not clean, but these guys are getting wounds all over their hands and they're getting these diseases on top of it. What action do you think our author wants us to take? Not now, but let's say for readers that were reading this when it came out. So in 1906, what would he want readers to have done? If you said something along the lines of he may have wanted readers to demand government regulations to improve the working conditions of slaughterhouses, you're correct. There's also another answer. He keeps talking about people getting hurt in this paragraph. So not just demand government regulations um, to improve working conditions, but also to, to improve the cleanliness of um, 
the slaughterhouses, which relates to working conditions because injuries can come from working in filth as well. But also, like, if somebody is bleeding and they're working with raw meat, that's going into your food. That's nasty. Okay? So there are, it's twofold. All right, let's move on. Pluckers, whose hands went to pieces even sooner than the hands of the picklemen, for the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool. And then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands till the acid had eaten their fingers off. There were those who made the tins for the canned meat, and their hands too were a maze of cuts, and each cut represented a chance for blood poisoning. Some worked at the stamping machines, and it was very seldom that one could work long there at the pace that was set, and not give out and forget himself, and have a part of his hand chopped off. There were the hoisters, as they were called, whose task it was to press the lever which lifted the dead cattle off the floor. They ran along upon a rafter, peering down through the damp and the steam, and as old Durham's architects had not built the killing rooms for the convenience of the hoisters, at every few feet they would have to stoop under a beam, say four feet above the one they ran on, which got them into the habit of stooping, so that in a few years they would be walking like chimpanzees. Worst of any, however, were the fertilizer men, and those who served in the cooking rooms. These people could not be shown to the visitor, for the odor of a fertilizer man would scare any ordinary visitor at a hundred yards. And as for the other men, who worked in tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which there were open vats near the level of the floor, their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats, and when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out to the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. All right, so take a second. Let's reflect on, on what we just read. Honestly speaking, this book as a whole, it's really gross. It is such a good book. But to just realize that this man witnessed some of these things happening or interviewed people that told him about some of the things that were going on in the meatpacking industry is, it's atrocious. Now, take a couple minutes and I want you to decide what the author's purpose was. Why was he writing this text? Consider like the last sentence in paragraph four, the paragraph we just read. He says, uh, the last half of it is, and then when they fished out, and then, and then when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days till all but the bones of them had gone into the world as Durham's leaf lard. Why would Sinclair build a sentence so that it concludes with such a disturbing detail. It's talking about men falling into these giant vats and essentially disintegrating and people eating it because they couldn't find the bodies, they waited till they were just bones, and then they still sold that product. Why would he end on such a disturbing detail? If you said something along the lines of the idea that workers fell into the vats, died, and ended up as part of the lard the company sold, could shock readers into realizing that he or she may have committed cannibalism. This would have produced rev revulsion, anger, and outrage. Could you imagine having used this product countless times and then finding out that it's possible you ate another human? I can't imagine that. I would be livid. I don't know what I would do. 
And Sinclair knows this is the normal reaction. So we talked earlier in this year about ethos, pathos, and logos. You definitely have pathos at work here because he's trying to make you feel that anger and disgust at how could this happen. Okay? Now, you will have a quiz on this text in the next one, so make sure that you have marked your annotation so that you could use that for your test. Um, and that's it for the reading part of today, um, today's lesson. So check Google Classroom for the second part of your assignment, and I will see you guys tomorrow.